God be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, Anybody who receives my commandments and keeps them will be one who loves me. And anyone who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I shall love him and show myself to him. Judas, this was not Judas Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what is all about? Do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we shall come to him and make our home with him. Those who do not love me do not keep my words, and my word is not my own. It is the word of the one who sent me. I have said these things to you while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, teach you everything and remind you of all I have said to you. The Gospel of the Lord. So we thank Konika for, for reading the, the first reading. Um, I think we have a new lecture now. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Mike say it. <laughs> so my dear friends, we we find ourselves with the mission continuing, the mission of Paul and Barnabas. The mission of Paul and Barnabas in, in um, chapter 14 of Acts mirrors the mission of Peter and John. Remember when we read earlier, Peter and John were on their way to the temple and a man looked at a man, stretched out his hand and said, Silver and gold I cannot give you, but what I have in the name of Jesus, receive the healing. And the man got up and walked. Here, Peter, uh, um, Paul and Barnabas are doing the same thing, but now they're doing it not in Jerusalem, but in pagan territory of Lyconia. They're doing it there, and this is a different context. So, here, they are on their way to the synagogue, and they meet this man, and Peter, uh, Paul heals the man in a very similar fashion. Paul looks at the man and, and heals the man, and the man gets up. And when the man got up, he said, yeah, these men have to be gods. Look, the, the, that one is Zeus, and that one is Hermes. These, these men, what they did can't be normal. They have to be some kind of god. And immediately, the people began to follow them. Now, when in, 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 in Peter and, and John healed the man, the priest and the Sanhedrin tried to throw them into prison because they were proclaiming Jesus. Here, the priest from the Greek temple came and offered sacrifices to Peter, uh, to Paul and Barnabas. So, you have a different context. And one of the things that we must remember is that every time we go to proclaim the message of good news, we have to understand the context in which it is proclaimed. What worked in Jerusalem may not work in Lyconia. You have to change it. You have to adapt it. Because in Jerusalem, you are Jews. In Lyconia, you are Greeks. And they are familiar with the Greek pantheon of gods. And so Paul, being a learned man in Acts chapter 17, Paul will go to Athens. And Paul will begin to, to talk about the, the, the Greek gods. Because Paul was familiar with that. As a bridge by which he can then talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important to meet people where they are at. But don't leave them there. And that's a mistake very often we make. We want to meet people where they are. And some people want to stay there. No, no, no. You meet people where they are at, but we move on. We must grow. We must grow. So that's, that's, that's what Paul and, and, and Paul and Barnabas did. They were able to meet the Greeks where they were at. But then they were able to cause the community to grow. So then Paul will make a second visit to the community and he will exhort them. He will encourage them. He will write to them. This is a community that I have formed. I feel like my, uh, that I am your father, Paul will say. Because Paul now is, is nurturing the community. When we are in a community, we have to grow. We have to grow. Growth is something that is natural to all human beings. And if our spiritual lives, we are not growing, to grow means really to, to unite ourselves more closely with the values of Christ. That Christ must be all and all in us. 
Let me nothing else. Paul says, I count all that I had as absolute rubbish for the supreme privilege of knowing Christ Jesus. Paul didn't give up a little bit, no. Paul was a Pharisee, and he trained under the brightest men in Jerusalem, Gamaliel, one of the greatest Pharisees in the time of Paul. He was very educated, and Paul said, I give up all of that for the supreme, he didn't say I give it up, he said, I count all as rubbish for the supreme privilege of knowing Jesus Christ. Sometimes we hold on to foolishness. When we have encountered the Lord, everything else must become relative to Christ. Everything else. Our lives must be so moved that we must be willing to do everything for the sake of the kingdom of God. And unless we come to that place where we see everything else as absolute rubbish for the supreme privilege of knowing Christ Jesus, then we would be stunted in our growth. Our growth will become stunted. It's one thing that we people are found where they are, but then we must grow. You know, in the, in the gospel, Jesus comes and he says, when he comes and he says, he looks at the tree and he says, but you have no fruit? Let me give you our next year. We give you our next year. And if we come back next year and you still have no fruit, we'll cut it down. Because the Lord is expecting growth. The Lord is expecting us to grow. We must grow. As Christians, it is not just enough for us to be a Christian. As a Christian, we have to grow every day in the ways of the Lord. And that's Jesus' expectation of us. He's looking for us to bear fruit. He's looking for us more and more to commune with him. For him to be all in all in us. And the growth comes the more we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit places in our heart an insatiable thirst for God and for the things of God. And the Holy Spirit brings about that inner transformation and conversion in our hearts and in our lives. By the things that we felt that we were not able to give up. The Holy Spirit gives us that grace. He gives us that grace and that strength that we will be able to experience a transformation. But we have to open our hearts to it. We have to open our hearts to it and be docile to the work of the Spirit in our lives. The more we humble ourselves, the more we surrender the things of the Spirit, the things of the world in our lives, the more we'll see the grace of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. But the Holy Spirit is also the memory of the church because the work of Paul and Barnabas, Peter and John can only take place in the power of the Holy Spirit. But here in the, in the gospel reading of the day, the text says that the advocate, Jesus says, I have said these things to you while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything. The Holy Spirit will teach you everything. Jesus did not tell the disciples everything. He left, he left them the basic foundation and they had to figure it out. But they didn't have to figure it out by themselves. They figured it out by under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is the memory of the church. In every age, in every age, the Holy Spirit is present to the church in every age so that we who are the church can discern what is necessary in our time. What worked for Paul and Peter? What worked for Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages? What worked in the past 20 years will not work today. It's as simple as that. And anybody who believes that, you're fooling yourself. The world is changing too fast. And so we have to now understand the context in, in how we present the message of good news to our people today. And to do that, we have to ask the Holy Spirit, which is the memory of the church, the Holy Spirit that gives us the grace of discernment to know what we ought to do and what we should not do and how we are to do it by prayer and fasting and by and by discerning as a body not as individuals but as a body priests and people bishop priests and people pope priests and people and bishops as a people to discern where is the spirit moving in our time and what is the holy spirit doing this idea that this one has some direct line to God 
It's a very dangerous thing. I have too many people. I have direct lines to God. And somebody came to me up. Um, look at this picture here. And, and, and Mary saying this and Mary saying that. I say, hmm? I know my Mary. I know Mary. I know my Mary. Mary don't talk. Mary don't say them kind of thing. So, so whoever Mary tell you that, them thing, don't come and me and tell me that. I don't want to hear that. See, the problem is we think that we have some special access to knowledge of God. There's no special access. The knowledge of God is right here, right here, written down. But the Spirit makes it fresh in the hearts of the people, in the midst of the community of faith. In the midst of the community. That's why the Word of God is read in the midst of the community. Because all of us together have the Holy Spirit by which we are able to discern. In, in, in theological language, we call it the fides, the census fidei of the people, the sense of the people. Granny who pray in her rosary, Emma Domina, you think you could go and, and, and um, hand Granny on consecrated bread and pestilence communion? She has a sense of the faith. She has a sense of the faith. And she's able to discern, she's able to discern, even though she did not study at any university, what is and what is not. Because the Holy Spirit resides in her too, and in all of us. And that's why, as a community, we need to always pray together, where two or three are gathered in my name. I am in the midst. So Jesus is made present by the power of the Holy Spirit. The memory of Jesus is made present by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we, the church, enlightened by God's Spirit, now have the responsibility to discern as a body. But a special responsibility is given to the bishops, who have line of succession from the apostles, and, and they are tasked with safeguarding the faith. So the are the ones who are responsible for handing on the faith, and they are, are held with great responsibility for the proclamation of the faith. For when Bishop Harvey was, was made a bishop, there's a whole bunch of rituals that, that, that are done. A whole bunch of rituals that are done. But, so one of the rituals I remember in one of the churches before was he had to make a profession of faith. And the wording of that was so frightening. It was the most frightening thing in the, in the responsibilities that God will call you. When you, when you ascend to those positions, to guard this, literally guard it with your life. And so this, what we have, my dear brothers and sisters, is not mere joke. This, what we have, is precious. And the Holy Spirit has entrusted it to the church. The Holy Spirit makes it fresh. And we must find ways, like Paul, uh, like, like Paul and John, like like Paul and Barnabas, Peter and John, to once again proclaim this message fresh in the midst of the Christian community. But we must first be convicted of this and must be willing to live out this message in our lives each day. My dear friends, this is what we are challenged to do. And this is what God is calling all of us. And so we give God thanks today for the great example of Paul, the great evangelizer of the Gentiles, and Barnabas, the one who encourages. We give God thanks for both of them, men of great example, on fire with a passion for the Lord. May we too be enthused with the things of the Lord, so that we can count everything else as rubbish for the supreme privilege of knowing Christ Jesus.